Hey everybody, Cole here with Classic Mini DIY, and it is time to put together the motor once and for all. Now this video has been a tough video for me to film. I have started this, I've created the intro multiple times, and I have also gone to put together this motor four or five times now, and there's always been something that's popped up, and most of the time it's been issues caused by me and things I've forgotten, things I've ordered incorrectly. And let me tell you that it has become very frustrating for me. Now, the reason I am filming this intro again is so that I can level set with you guys. The motor assembly has been kind of weird. It's been out of order. Some things have been done, some things haven't. And the video might seem out of order a little bit as we go through the next clips. So I just wanted to kind of give you that, set the stage for this, and, uh, and kind of apologize. You know, I want this to be very helpful for you guys, and I think it still will be. Um, but if anything's confusing, now you know why. Now before we dive into getting this motor assembled for good, there are a couple things I want to touch base on real quick. First, something that I'm very, very excited about, and if you follow me on Instagram, at ClassicMiniDIY59, go follow me there if you don't. I post stuff really regularly about the mini, about the things that I'm doing. Often it sneak peeks into episodes that are upcoming. But if you haven't followed me, if you haven't seen what I've posted there, I have brand new t-shirts available for sale. And these t-shirts are totally custom designed. They are made by a company called Flesh and Bone Design, and they have created these for Classic Mini DIY, and Classic Mini DIY is the only place you can get these. Now, it comes in a light version and a dark version, and I am super, super excited to share these with you guys. So, if you want to pick up one of these t-shirts, they are available worldwide. You can pick them up no matter where you live, and if you use the coupon code that is popping up on the bottom here, you can get an additional 5% off the first order of this t-shirt as a thank you for being one of the first to order this. So, very excited about that. The second thing I wanna to touch on really, really quickly is that I want to say thank you to Venom Steel. They provide these gloves for me and they don't require me to plug this in the channel or anything, but these gloves are incredible. I always buy these ones when they are available to me and before they sent me these, but they sent me 600 pairs of gloves, or 600 gloves, not 600 pairs. Still, it's a crazy amount of gloves. I wanna say thank you to Venom, and if you guys need latex gloves, head over to the Amazon links in my description. Um, these things are strong, they hold up, and, uh, and I think, technically, they're only supposed to be one use, but, I definitely use these multiple times before throwing them away because they're so strong. Anyways, that's it for the intro. Let's get into putting the motor together and, uh, and get this thing ready to go back in the car. I'm tired of not being able to drive my Mini. All right, now to start off, we are looking at the block mounted up to the engine stand again. And as you can see, all the paint has dried. I'm gonna have to come back over here and kind of scuff up this stuff and get all that taken care of because it did bleed over a little bit, but this is all right right here. This is right at the edge of where the head sits. And then the rest of this obviously needs to be blank for your head gasket. Um, this needs to be a clean surface. But I'll get to that in a little while. I'll do that a little bit later probably, not even in this episode. Um, but today, let's turn this engine on its side. So the first thing that we're gonna do is rotate this all the way over. And what we're gonna start with is putting our lifters back into the block. Now, let me get a better camera angle for you guys so you can see this a little bit better. All right, so starting off, what I wanna call out first is the fact that this is an A series block, not an A plus block. And what's important about that is the fact that the A series block does not have tappet covers. So you can't actually put the lifters into these slots on the back of the motor like you can on the A-plus blocks. You have to do it with the motor upside down, and you got to put these lifters in the other way around. Now to start off, the first thing that we're going to do is really thoroughly coat these lifters with specifically a cam lube. Now the reason I'm going to be using cam lube this time is because cam lube is very, very strong. It's very, very thick, and it stays where you put it. 
So when you coat this with that lube, it's gonna stay in the spot that you put it when you put these lifters in. Now, keep in mind, these lifters need to slide in very smoothly into these holes, and you shouldn't have any resistance. Now one thing I want to call out about these lifters is that these are the cold rolled steel or cold rolled iron. I can't remember the material, but they are super reinforced. I got these from 7 Mini Parts. They have two different kinds. There are the legit original ISKI uh, cold rolled lifters, and then there are these remanufacturers of them. And the remanufacturers are just as strong, but they're quite a lot less expensive. So you can go with either. You can go with the name brand, know that they're good. Or you could get these remanufacturers and they are also very, very good. There's no reason not to get these. Obviously I'm about to put them in my motor. And what they'll give you in benefit is they'll give you an actual hole here for, a, for oil to pass around and through this lifter. It allows it to stay cooler and more lubricated. And then in addition to that, it's much stronger. So this is gonna be a nice, strong lifter for the brand new camshaft that I'm gonna be putting in here. So. Let's go ahead and start coating these. I don't have gloves still, so about to get dirty. Now, when you put these in, you're gonna put them in with the flat face sticking up towards you, so facing down to the bottom of the motor effectively. So we're gonna drop these in, and it should slide right in nice and easy. Now, if it doesn't, you can also come back and lube up these holes really good. So I'm gonna come through and put this cam lube on these holes, get that really nice and lubed up. All right, so now we have all of our lifters in. The next thing that we wanna do is put our camshaft in. And this is a little bit out of the order that I did it on the A plus block, and that's because I can't flip this motor over until I put that camshaft in here. So I'm gonna stick that in here, making sure to take extra care to put the camshaft with the drive end towards where the oil pump goes. So if you're looking at this motor right now, this is the front side of the motor, and this is the back, and you want your side of the camshaft with the drive to be pointing towards the end where your oil pump sits on your block. And that's the side that faces the transfer case and that side of the motor. Now you can also see I am putting cam lube on the actual cam bearings. This is also extremely important because these are brand new cam bearings and it, they need to break in and they need to be nice and lubricated when they do break in. If you have any of these lifters that aren't adequately lubricated as well, you're gonna to wanna to take an opportunity to go ahead and put a little bit more oil on these. All right, so now we have our camshaft and this is nice and sealed from the folks over at Mini Spares where I got it. I am trying out this camshaft because I've never bought one from them. Um, and this one is a Evo 001 cam. It was recommended to me by Paul Jeffries. He's put them in a few of his motors and he has been extremely happy with them. So I trust him and I trust his judgment. So I'm gonna give these a shot. Now, most of the time these come pre-lubricated, but it's not the kind of lubrication that you need before it goes in. So I like to go ahead and toss a little bit on the bearing faces because those are gonna be the first part that kind of really gets a lot of force all while this motor is sitting in here. Go ahead and get that nice and good. And now what I'll do is I'll come in from the side that I have my timing gears going on later. And be careful, these, uh, these camshafts like to kind of eat fingers. So just take your time, slide that in, and look at that. That fits in, slides nice and smooth. This is gonna be really, really nice. Now, we have the camshaft in here, and it can't go any farther this way because of the lobes on this side, but it can fall out on this side. So you're gonna to wanna to take extra care while it's sitting in here to make sure that it doesn't fall out because that's obviously really bad. You don't want your camshaft to fall out because if it does and it gets dinged at all, it's pretty much toast. There's not really any repairing it. All right, so now we are looking at the side with the oil pump and the actual drive of the camshaft. So let me grab my oil pump, which is gonna be brand new. This is one of those parts that you are always going to wanna to put a brand new unit in when you're rebuilding a motor. There's absolutely no good reason not to do this. 
Now, keep in mind that if you have an A-series block and you wanna use an A-plus camshaft, you have to change the oil pump. The reason it's, what makes it an A-plus camshaft specifically is the fact that it's slot drive. And the earlier model minis had a different drive type. So on this pump right here, you can see it has a slot drive. And let me grab my old oil pump. This right here is a spider drive. So you have this kind of like spline drive. I think they also call it a spline drive, a spline spider. And then it has this little adapter that goes in the camshaft. So slot drive is what we're upgrading to. And while we're putting this on, we need a gasket. Otherwise, we're not gonna get a good seal here. And that gasket goes on just like any other gasket. I add Permatex to it to make a nice tight seal. And then it slides on, presses in, and then you screw it on like any other part. So the way I like to do this generally is by finding a, by lining up all of these holes. And as you can see, one hole is small, one hole is large, and these will all line up. You'll allow your screw holes to line up as well. And this little notch will sit right up at the top. Now, once I verify that this fits on here, which it should, there's no reason it shouldn't, I take my Permatex and I'm actually gonna press it on there. All right, so the camera died when I was putting the oil pump on, but it's pretty straightforward. You literally just put it on. You just push it on and screw it in. Um, if you guys would like to see the exact way that the oil pump goes on, you can check out my 998 rebuild, which should pop up in the corner here somewhere. Um, that is going to give you a better idea how that goes on. Pretty straightforward though, like I said. The next thing that we're gonna do is we are going to put our crankshaft in. At this stage, if you have had your crankshaft machined, you need to make sure that you've got bearings that are going to fit the new machined version of the crankshaft. The machine shop that you brought the crank to or whoever did that machining should have given you a new spec. In my case, I know for sure that my crank was turned a little bit and it did have to get some new bearings. This was done the last time I built this motor and that was about a year ago. So crank's still in great shape. I know what I need to get, so I got them. And uh, your bearings look something like this. They're pretty simple. It's just a metal face that gets pressed into the space right here. And that allows your crankshaft to spin on something and provides a wear face. Now, if you simply just set it inside your block, what would end up happening is, is as soon as the crank started to damage this, or you started to have oil pressure problems, you would be running down the block and ultimately destroying the block itself. This allows you to rebuild your motor should something like that happen. Now, the first thing that you need to do is put some assembly lube on this. So I'm gonna grab my assembly lube, coat this up, and I'm going to press it into all three of these seats. Now, these pieces only go in one way. There's nothing fancy about it. It simply slides in. There's a notch on the end of the bearing, and this just pops right into these bearing seats. And the channels inside these, you can actually see here, are used to channel oil up to the crankshaft and allow it to keep lubricated and also to keep it cool. And that is how your motor prevents any sort of premature failure or things from overheating and exploding inside your motor. Now for this build, it's pretty straightforward. You have a 1275 block, you've got 1275 bearings and a 1275 crank. And with all of that stuff matching up, these holes in the bottom of these bearings match up with the holes on the block. One thing you might find if you're doing a different kind of build, and I cover this in my 998 rebuild video, these holes might not match up and they have to be ground down and machined a little bit to allow oil to pass through. So not something that you need to worry about on a 1275, generally speaking. And so, like I said, things are in good shape. Now what we can do is grab the crankshaft and set it down into place right here. Now, there's only one way that your crankshaft goes in and that is like this. Your crank will sit down right into those bearing faces. Spin that around a little bit, get you some oil. Looking good. And now that sits down in there and on this end right here is where your clutch and transfer case goes and that's on the side with your oil pump. And then on the other side you have your end that will allow you to put your crank gear that connects to all of your timing gears on that side. Now, there's something called end float, 
And I'm not gonna measure it on this build because I know I've already got the thrust washers that fit for this. Now, in float is basically how much your crank moves from side to side, as you can see there. And you wanna prevent in float. And you need to measure in float when you are rebuilding a motor. In my case, I have thrust washers in here and I know what the end float is and should be. Now the thrust washers look something like this. Now on my motor, I have to go 005 over to ensure that there is no premature rubbing or anything that's causing any problems. Now putting in these thrust washers is pretty straightforward. Now the way I do it is by putting the thrust washer on the side of your crank and then simply spinning your crank and ensuring that thrust washer slides down in there. Now you want the copper face to face out towards the crankshaft on each side. So what I'm saying here is there is kind of a, a orangey copper side and a not orangey copper side. And you want the orangey copper side to face the crank itself, the spinning part of your motor. Now you might be wondering, well, you have thrust washers down on the bottom. Do you need them on top as well? And yes, you do. So this is the center cap, the main cap for my crankshaft. And this goes on right here, pretty straightforward. And the way that this works and the way that the thrust washers sit on your main cap is just like this. One of your thrust washers has a notch on the top that sits down and just like the bottom, you want this copper side facing the crankshaft. All right, so we officially have the crankshaft back from the machine shop. Now, in the last video, I don't remember what I said. So if you're hearing this, it's because I did not actually explain what was going on in the last video. Whoops. There are two things that had to get done before I could put this crank in here. First being, I actually got new bearings and I set my crankshaft down in here, but the crank actually wouldn't spin after torquing the center cap down. And that was concerning to me, but I'm not totally certain that it wasn't just the bearings. Maybe I ordered the wrong size. There are a few things that it could be. So I ordered another set of bearings, but unfortunately before I could test them out, I had to get my primary gears bushing installed. So this is the primary gear. It sits on the big end of your crankshaft and this meshes with this right here meshes with your drop gear and then your clutch and everything sit on the end of this. Now, when I bought this, it needed a new top hat bushing on the end of the primary gear. And that process is a bit involved. Um, you have to, one, get the old bushing out, then you have to machine the new bushing in, and then you actually have to hone the inside of this bushing to mate with your crankshaft with 0 .002, so two thou uh, of clearance between the two of them. So. Obviously not something I can do in my garage. So that had to go to the machine shop. That went to the machine shop with the crankshaft, which prevented me from finishing this off. So I've got both of them back and now we can put the bearings back in here and test this out again. Now, just like the other bearing, you're gonna to wanna to press that in. And then these only go on in a certain place. So this side right here has two holes in it and that's used for, and that's used for tightening down the cover that goes on the side of your motor that has your timing system on it. So you press this down on here, just like that. And like I did before, I take my rubber mallet, pop that into place. And then of course, we take our two bolts, run them down hand tight. And then you just repeat the same process for the last end cap. Now, at this point, you've got everything hand tight. Make sure that your crankshaft spins freely, doesn't have any sort of binding or hooking, if it does, you need to take this out and bring it to the machine shop because it means that your line bore might be off or there could be some other problems. The machine shop should know and should be able to diagnose those for you. So now we're moving on to the step of actually torquing these down. Now, what I like to do is do this in steps. So I start with 20 foot pounds 
And what that's going to allow me is to check the line bore every time I bring it around and torque it. So starting with 20 foot pounds, we start with our center cap. So now we got to tighten this up to the next step, which is 40 foot pounds. Now the last step, like I said, 65. And there we have it, a nice torque down crankshaft. And it still spins nice and free. And if you haven't checked it yet, now is the time that you would check your end float. And there's a few different ways you can do this. One way is by setting up a dial indicator on the right side here, putting it on the end of your small end of the crank. You can also technically do it on the big end of your crank, but it's a little easier over here because it's shorter. And then you measure the amount of play that you have when you stick a small screwdriver or a pry bar in here. So in my case, I've got virtually no play. That's because I've already measured my end float and I know it's good. But the other way you can do it is by sticking a feeler gauge. And that's the classic way to do it. You take a feeler gauge, you run it in between your thrust washer and the side of your crankshaft when you play this back and forth. So a couple ways to achieve that. Both are good and effective ways to determine that end float. So now that we've done this, the next step is putting our pistons in. This is a pretty fun step. So I'm going to rotate the motor back over to the other side, taking extra care because my camshaft is not fully locked into place. So I need to go over this way because I don't want my camshaft to fall out. Well, ladies and gents, unfortunately, and much to my dismay, and frustration. The bearings for my pistons, specifically the connecting rods, are not the right size. They are too loose. The pistons are bouncing around on the crankshaft, which is not what should be happening. So what that means is that I am going to have to get new bearings for that, even though I'm totally like almost 100% certain that I matched what I had on there when I took it off. So that's super great. But what we can do now, I guess, is go ahead and start putting together this side of the motor. Um, obviously, I cannot do the cam timing completely, but I can at least put the plate over here and start dry fitting the adjustable cam gears and getting a good look at how those sit on this whole system here. But man, talk about frustrating. For you guys, luckily, this engine video is only going to release once I can fully build this thing. So after I finish this, I'm going to jump right back into putting the pistons in once the new parts come. But until that happens, no dice. All right, so now we are fast forwarded to right after I filmed my intro, but it's a few weeks later. I have the bearings that I actually need for the motor and for the connecting rods specifically, and I can finally put the heckin' pistons in here. So first I need to reference my sheet that I had that had all of my scratch marks on it that showed me where the pistons went. I'm gonna set that off to the side. The process of putting pistons in is pretty much the same no matter where the pistons go. When you take them out, it was important that you keep them in the order that they came out so you can put them in in the order they need to go back in. So that's what that reference sheet is for. I have my piston ring compressor and from here I can make sure that my piston rings are not lined up and we are going to figure out what the first piston is and we're going to put that in here. Now keep in mind this side of the motor with the thermostat housing opening is the front of your motor. This is the side that radiator sits on and it's considered the front. So I am going to figure out what cylinder one requires 
I'm going to put oil on the sides of the cylinders here and then I'm going to make sure that that slides in, compresses, and then slides down into the cylinder here. Of course, before I do that, I have to put on the rod bearings. Now, once we have those out, you do want to make sure that you inspect them, make sure that there's nothing wrong with them, and, uh, and that there is no imperfections in them, because even the smallest thing getting on these bearings can damage your crankshaft. I'm, and I'm talking like a hair. Like even a strand of hair can cause damage to your crankshaft and to the bearings. Now to start off, I'm going to press the bearings into every one of the connecting rods as well as the connecting rod caps there. All right, so next step, now that we've pressed all of these bearings in, is to take some oil and coat the inside of your cylinders here. This is going to aid in the pistons setting in in their first sweep of the motor and as it starts to get started the first time. Now, I've heard a lot of different opinions on the oil that you should use in your cylinders and in the break-in process. And the general consensus I have seen on the internet and uh, the places that I've researched this is to use a little bit of your motor oil that you normally use to break in and to allow these pistons to set in. Now, I've seen things about graphite lube and all these different kinds of lubrication, but the one I've seen the most is regular motor oil that you use in your motor. And now we'll just go ahead and set that piston down in there kind of rest on its rings there. As you can see, it won't slide all the way down. And that is where our piston ring compressor comes into play. Now, normally this comes with like an Allen wrench thing that you can use to tighten and loosen this. Of course, I have lost mine. So what I'll be using is just a basic flathead screwdriver that will fit inside there. Double check that your piston rings are all in the correct orientation, AKA not lined up with each other because those piston rings do have gaps. And then we'll just put our piston ring compressor around our piston here. Now, one thing to keep in mind is sometimes those piston rings like to pop out of the bottom of your compressor here. And if they do that, you're gonna to wanna to make sure that you get them back in there so that you can tighten it up and make sure they compress properly. And now I found the easiest way to get these in here is to simply tap on it with the wood end of a mallet. Now you don't want to force it. If it doesn't start to go in there, it probably means that your rings are not fully compressed or they've popped out like so. And if you force it down in there, what's going to happen is you could break some of your piston rings, which is not ideal. And for this first one, I'm gonna rotate this over so you can get a kind of a glimpse at the bottom of what it should look like. And then each piston, as you put it in, you're gonna to wanna to tighten these down and torque them down. Or at least get them quite hand tight so you can get them tightened, torqued down all at once at the end. But this will allow you to ensure that there is no bouncing around and they are you know, seating properly on your crankshaft. All right, I'm very pleased to say that these bearings fit. They're the right ones, and I can finally assemble the rest of this motor. So you should be able to move this pretty freely. Um, there shouldn't be a lot of binding. If there is, you're gonna wanna kind of revisit things and make sure that it's seated in there properly. <laughs> And so now we've got the motor flipped over, looking pretty good. And the next thing that we're gonna need to do is torque down our pistons. Now, these bolts need to get torqued down to 46 foot-pounds, according to my Haynes manual. So, I'm going to adjust my torque wrench to 46 foot-pounds, lock that in place. And now, I'm gonna torque these suckers down. All 
All right, folks, so now it's time for something that is a little confusing for people to initially get, but once you get it, it kind of makes a lot of sense. But it's that first kind of grasping the idea that makes it difficult for a lot of people in the beginning. Now, to start off, what you have to do is find top dead center of your number one piston. So we're looking at the side with your thermostat housing, and your piston needs to be at top dead center. The process of finding the degree of your camshaft is primarily finding the degree of lift that happens between the front of a camshaft lobe and the back of a camshaft lobe. And so what I'll do is I'll put something on the screen here, kind of an illustration, and sorry for the crude representation of this, but your camshaft is shaped like a lobe, and then you have two spots, one on each side, that we're gonna be measuring the distance and the difference between. So first thing that we have to do before we're able to even find that degree difference is to bring your piston to top dead center. So I have already done that on my car. And to do this, I'm using a degree dial indicator. This is important for this process because if you don't have this, you're not really gonna be able to dial in top dead center. Now it's quite easy to get to top dead center when the engine is apart like this. Essentially, you are trying to find the hesitation point in the fullest amount of lift on your first piston. So we're looking at the side with the thermostat housing, a radiator would normally sit right here, and your piston in its motion is going like this, it comes up, goes back down just a little bit, goes back up, and then back down. Now that's exaggerated, at its very peak, at its full lift, it's really only going like just a little tiny bit, but I can't even illustrate the small amount of lift that happens. But your degree indicator is gonna help you find the difference between that and the actual center point. When it's open like this, it's usually pretty easy to kind of just get that to its sweet spot and its top dead center. Once you have that done, what I would strongly recommend doing is going ahead and putting on your timing gear. Now, this timing gear is from a company called MED, and they make some really, really beautiful work. I mean, this is a steel veneered aluminum center uh, timing system with a duplex chain. I strongly recommend picking up a duplex chain as long as you're not trying to go like full original on your build. And there are two dots normally on your timing chain and on the cam gear here. Now these two dots need to be lined up and then what you're gonna do is slide these down onto the camshaft and the crankshaft. Now there are keyways which will allow this to slide down on top of it um, and it's usually easiest to go ahead and put a little bit of lubrication on the end of this. That's gonna help us slide that down as well as on the end of the camshaft here. All right, so now we have our timing gear on, we have our crank gear on, and then we went ahead and tightened down our dial indicator here. And now, as you can see, I've created a rudimentary uh, pointing device using a little pokey thing. And I have pointed that at, whoops, I'm gonna rotate this around. I have rotated that and pointed it at top dead center. Now. The reason I know this is top dead center is because I've already zeroed out top dead center here. The next step is zeroing out your lifter. Now, this is pretty much the same process as zeroing out your piston, um, but what we're gonna do is turn this motor on its side, and then I'll show you a little bit more detail about how we can do that. All right, so next up, we're gonna be dialing in our lifter. Now, our lifter, lifts our rocker assembly and helps deliver fuel to the motor when you need it. Now, in order to do that, we are going to need to put one of our lifters in right here in your intake lift. And the intake lifter is the one that is second from the front of the motor. 
And so we are going to do pretty much the same thing we just did on the piston and we're going to find the hesitation point for our lifter. So let's go ahead and rotate the motor over until we get to that point. All right, so now we have the dial gauge zeroed out on our intake valve. And to recap, the way that I did this is I took my lifter, I set it down in the intake port, which is the second port on your head. You should be able to see that there in the video. And this second port, you allow your lifter to pass through, push down on the lifter. And what that does is it presses the lifter down onto the actual camshaft. You set your dial indicator up on the top and the same way that we found top dead center on this first piston, you find top dead center on the end of this lifter. And that is the point of hesitation right at the top of the lift cycle. Now this is the part that I think was the most confusing for me and I only really just figured it out now. So what we are doing is we're measuring the amount of advance that the camshaft is, is actually providing us. So the way that we do that is first by spinning the motor clockwise. And when I say clockwise, I am referencing from the front view of the motor. So the side with all of the timing gears. So from that side, you are going to be rotating it clockwise. Now you're not going to want to rotate it a lot. You're actually only going to rotate it to five degrees on your dial indicator. So in my case, I'm going to move the dial indicator by rotating the motor five degrees to 45. All right, so we're gonna rotate it. A little too far, there we go. Now we have it at five degrees off the, off the top of the lifter. So what we'll do now is come over to our dial indicator and we're going to read what it says on the dial indicator. Now make a note, this is top dead center. So we're gonna count up to 90 but as you can see, the numbers start going back down over here. So we're gonna to have to add from 90, 100, 120, 130. And from this angle right here, it looks like it's actually, it looks like it's actually 129. So we're gonna come up here and write down 129. All right, now, we're gonna come back to the motor, rotate it anti-clockwise, back to zero, and then back to five degrees. There we go, five degrees. We're gonna come back to our dial indicator, read it again, and what we have here is pretty much 90 right on the money. So we're gonna come over here, write 90 down. And now what we're gonna do is a simple math equation. And to find the degree of difference, we need to add 129 to 90. And then what we have there is 219. And then you take that number, divide it by two, and you have your amount of lift and the current degree of your camshaft. So in my case, I have a 109.5. And for my camshaft, what I need is 106.5 degrees of advance. Now, the nice thing about this gear is that it's adjustable while it's on the motor here. Now to do that, I'm gonna have to come in here, loosen all these Allen keys, and then I'm going to have to turn the cam. I'm gonna turn the cam gear just a hair and then we're gonna remeasure this. Now, it should be pretty easy. I only have to go two degrees, so let's loosen the sucker up and then we will remeasure this and make sure that we're in the right range for this camshaft. And so what I've done is I've retarded it just a little bit and I did that by moving the gear this direction and loosening it. As you can see, I didn't take anything off. Now, if you were using a regular cam gear in this situation, you would have to take it off and you'd have to purchase a small keyway which would allow you to advance it or retard it, whatever amount you need to. 
but in my case, I got this adjustable gear specifically so I didn't have to do that. Now, I can come through and tighten up all these bolts, and I have the desired cam lift on this now, and I'm ready to roll. Now, if you're wondering, the desired cam lift on the camshaft that I have is 106.5. All right, and with that, that's gonna wrap up part one of this engine reassembly. This episode is already like 40 minutes long, so I don't want it to just drag on forever. We will cover the rest of the engine assembly and put together and everything, hopefully in one more part, one more episode. Um, we might need two more, I'm not really sure. I guess we probably will with the transmission. But anyways, don't forget, you guys can get 5% off on the new t-shirt that I just dropped. If you head over to merch.classicminidiy.com and use the promo code ALPS-MINI. Also, one really quick thing, I completely redesigned my website and on my website I've got a lot of like torque specs and information about how to work on your car, manuals you might need, things like that. I completely redesigned the site. It's just classicminidiy.com. See what you guys think. If you have any feedback or any information you want to share with me, you have some suggestions, things I should add to the site, things that weren't right, you know, feel free to post them in the comment section below or to send me an email at, at classicminidiy at gmail.com. But until the next episode, until we get back into the motor and putting it all back together, enjoy those minis and motor on.